Hi everyone, I'm Aaron Wentz and I'm here to talk about the science of Christian leadership. Well, leadership is a science because it's something that you can be that can be learned. It's a skill and there's a right and a wrong to it. And so because I'm a believer and a follower of Jesus, I've taken these leadership principles that I've learned from experts like Harvard Business Review and thought through them in regard to the Bible and seeing how the experts in leadership match what the Bible says. And so it's been a four-year journey of studying uh, you know, secular experts on what is leadership and how to motivate people and how to create change in an organization and then looking at it through the Bible and realizing that what the leadership experts say about how to lead organizations and lead people goes right back to the Bible. So this talk today is about how to match, uh, match these two together. Well, all the experts say that leadership is influence. Leadership is influence. So think about the people that have influenced you the most. Uh, a mom or dad, a coach, a teacher. People that have taken time to care about you, invest in you, teach you, bless you, help you. And so an influencer is a leader. And you can be at a very small level, a very simple thing, or a very big thing. So a pastor, uh, a youth group leader, has tremendous, what, influence over somebody. You know who has the greatest influence in the world? Is a mother. <laughs> That's right. A mother from birth all the way through life has the most influence over somebody. So a mother is a leader. Now, an influencer can be positive or negative, right? Now, look about Jesus. What kind of influence did he have on people? Well, what did he do? He laid down his life for us and for his enemies. He influenced the world because of his love. Jesus is the greatest influencer because of his sacrificial service and help to us. And his influence on us has changed the world. The love of God and the gospel has changed the world. And so leadership is influence from, you know, helping someone at work to helping someone in school to being a parent, being a coach, being a teacher, leading an organization, being in the ministry. Anytime you're influencing someone, you're a leader. Now, this is Simon Sinek, and I love this quote by Simon Sinek. He said, leadership is a choice, not a rank. Uh, Simon Sinek is, from what I can tell, he's not a believer, but his ideas are amazing because they can be grounded in Scripture. Simon Sinek said, leadership is not a choice, excuse me, leadership is a choice, not a rank. Leadership is a choice, not a rank. What that means is anytime that you choose to influence somebody in a godly Christian way, you're leading, you're a leader. That's right. We often think about leadership as, well, I'm not the pastor, or I'm not, you know, the boss, but we need to flip that upside down and realize that if you're a parent, a coach, a teacher, a big brother, big sister, uh, anybody at any level, you can turn to the person next to you and influence them and you're leading. That's what a leader is. You're leading, you're influencing. And so Simon Sinek is exactly right. And so it comes down to the attitude of the leader. So how do you lead? You might want to change your church. Uh, change your youth group, change your job, change your, your family. Uh, moms and dads have tremendous influence in their home. Really, the home is the best place to practice leadership on your attitude, knowing that you have tremendous influence over your kids, over your wife. A husband is the head of the home. What does that mean? He is a leader. What does that mean? He has tremendous influence. So what does the husband, the leader of the home, is supposed to do? Well, he's supposed to, he's supposed to love. Because the greatest leader, the greatest influencer in the whole world is love. He served. He put a towel around his waist and bent down and served. And then he gave his life for our sins. 
And Jesus chose to do that. It wasn't about rank. He humbled himself and served us. And so the Philippians chapter 2 says, let this attitude be in us. So this attitude of choosing to influence people in a humble, godly, Christ-like way is what we're going to talk about. And so the size of leadership um, all across the board is this. What we do influences people. So think about it. If I'm mean, harsh, controlling, manipulative, uh, you know, the, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. And then the, the results of the flesh, right, is, is anger, bitterness, uh, rage, all these terrible things. So when, when someone in authority, in leadership, possesses anger and bitterness and controlling and micromanaging, well, how does that affect people? Well, they don't want to be around them. They don't like them. Well, how did Jesus influence people? Well, he was kind. He was loving. He was patient. Uh, he was all these things that attracted people. And so leadership experts say that if you don't have followers, you're not a leader yet. So if you look over your shoulder and there's no one joining your cause or coming to your church or coming to your youth group or joining your nonprofit, whatever it is, you're not a leader yet. And so how do you create people that want to follow you? Hopefully for the right reasons, right? For Christian purposes. It really comes down to how they feel about you. Uh, people follow Jesus because how they felt about him they were attracted to him. They were moved by him. They were touched by him. They saw his love and they saw his compassion and his kindness. And they were moved by him. They were moved by his teachings. And so really what leadership does with influence is that it affects the followers. And it's, and it's just natural the way God's designed us that we immediately have feelings or opinions about the person in charge. And so, how does the leader make you feel? And so, what I've done is that over these years of studying uh, leadership and getting my second master's in leadership from Grand Canyon University, what I've done is that I've written down the 10 building blocks of leadership. And these 10 building blocks, over time, made me realize how these things positively affect people and how they feel about you because again if you're mean and harsh and nasty and bitter and nobody wants to be around you and they'll vote with their feet and not come to church not come to your group never return it's like a bad customer experience right if you have a bad experience at a restaurant you won't go back just the way god made us so if someone is mean or nasty or rude in church People don't come back. It's just the way it happens. So our influence as a leader has to be Christ-like, knowing that leadership is a choice on how we treat people so that how they feel about you will be positive and they'll be attracted to you. So there's two things generally that make people want to follow people. Number one uh, coming from the leader is your purpose and vision. So every church, every group, every Christian organization have a, should have a very clear mission and purpose to what they do. Now, for the church in general, could you tell me what the mission and the purpose of the church is? So that's a basic question, but yet we often don't know why, why we're here. What is the purpose of church? Well, at the end of uh, Matthew, Mark, Acts, we're supposed to go out into all the world and make other followers of Jesus, baptize them, and teach them everything Jesus taught us so that it can be obedient. And so the Great Commission, go out and make other followers of Jesus. That's our mission. That's our goal. And so when a church, an organization, a nonprofit has a very clear vision and purpose um, loving people, uh, charities, mission organizations, making the world better, helping poverty, 
bringing the gospel as you're helping people out of poverty, whatever you're doing, inner city work, helping the poor, whatever you're doing, hopefully will bring the main mission along with that, which is the gospel, to save people. Your mission and vision will attract people that want to be a part of what you're doing. Um, you know, uh, my mom has gotten people around her to give to uh, building wells in Africa because of some people don't have clean water to drink. And she's gotten people to donate to that cause. And so because people like my mom, you know, how do they feel about her? They like her. They trust her. She put together a vision and said, hey, we need to help these people. People follow. They wanted to follow. And so if a church, a mission organization, a youth group, a nonprofit has a very clear mission and vision, then people will poke their head up and say, yeah, I want to be a part of that. Because every person wants to, be a, wants to be a part of something greater than themselves. But where did that come from? That's the image of God that God put in us. His image is in us. Uh, we want to help people. We want to love others. We want to make a difference. We want to serve. We want to do something with our life. That's the image of God in us, that we have a, a purpose. A, 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 we, want to, we want to, the will to live, to do something awesome with our life. So when you start, you set apart a vision, hopefully which is God's vision, which is to help people and to bring the gospel to them. Next, people will want to follow you. They'll start coming around and they'll start forming opinions about you and your organization. Well, people won't last very long the moment they start forming opinions about the leader. If the attitude of the leader is command and control, you know, he's the boss, he's the CEO, he's untouchable, he's the man, um, he's God's man, and he's way up there and we're way down here over time, people will start to feel controlled, manipulated, left out, um, and that's sad. And so sometimes, sadly, Christian leaders have huge egos, and it's all about them and their ministry. Anytime someone names a ministry after them, run. <laughs> Jesus is head of his church. We're just here to help his mission and his vision. So when people start coming around because of your mission and vision and what you do, they'll start to form opinions about you, about you and you as the leader. So now, if your character is good, they'll start to be attracted to it. They'll like you. So people don't often verbalize their feelings, but what's happening in the bubble is that over time, when people hang around you in your cause, in your church, in your organization, it's just a natural cause and effect of psychology on someone's heart. When you do something positive and you help them and you're part of a team and you're doing great things, people will start having feelings about you, like, I like him, I like her, appreciation. Uh, thankfulness, respect, right? I mean, has a pastor or uh, someone in ministry helped you? Um, sure, we can all look back and look at lots of people that have you know, helped us and served us and been there for us. And how does that make us feel? Well, we, you know, we like them, we appreciate them, we're thankful. And so we're, that's building followership, it's building team when someone has positively affected us. And so when a leader, an influencer, affects you, it makes you want to stick around. And then when a leader says, hey, can you do this for me? Can you help? Can you serve? We're more likely to say yes. Now, as a Christian, we often hear, you know, we should be empathetic, we should be ethical, we should listen, we should serve. But this... PowerPoint is really all about putting un everything under one roof to say, this is what leadership is at any level, and this is how everything all works together. Because when I was growing up, it was like, okay, leadership is influence. 
but how do you do that? And then I heard that we should be ethical and we should listen more and we should serve. And it was like these disconnected ideas. They're just all, they were all very disjointed. And so under one roof, under one PowerPoint here, I want to share with you how you create followers, how you create change, how you lead as a leader in any capacity that you're in. Well, you influence people. How do you do that? You influence it through your attitude and your character. Knowing that these 10 things are going to positively affect the emotions and the psychology of people that they're going to say, I like them, I appreciate them, I'm thankful. And then they'll start voting with their feet because you've helped and served them and benefited them. And those positive feelings of helping will create people that say, I want to be a part of what you're doing, I want to follow. So a great purpose and vision, helping people, loving, and the Great Commission, the gospel, along with people, the leader that is like Jesus, and you're benefiting greatly the followers. It's not about you. It's not about your cause. It's not about your ego. It's not about your ministry. It's not about making money. It's not about, it's about helping people and bringing the gospel to people's lives. Anytime we deviate from that, leaders fall, ministries fall, because they get selfish, self-centered, they get into the worldly ethic, it's about money and the leader and the ego, and that's when bad things happen. So now, these building blocks. Number one, servanthood, right? Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, Mark 10. The disciples are arguing, bickering about who's the greatest, right? The greatest of all time, the GOAT, greatest of all time. You know, Tom Brady, LeBron James, you know, we follow people on Facebook and on social media. Like, we, we look up to these people. They're, they're awesome. Who's the greatest? Jesus, in, in response to that, says something amazing. He said, he got them together and says, you know, people, the Gentiles, they lord it over. They command respect. They lord it over. They lord authority over people. Jesus said, not so with you. Demanding respect, demanding you're in control, demanding obedience. Jesus said, not so with you. Now, if you're a parent and you got a two-year-old, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, man to man, woman to woman, adult to adult, treating people, lording it over, commanding and control. Jesus said, not so with you. Instead, Whoever wants to be great must be your servant. And whoever wants to uh, be first must, must be a slave. Wow. Just as a son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. That's, <laughs> that's our mission for the rest of our life is think on that. Think on that. Let that soak in. It's totally... We're adopting the ways of the world. This, this philosophy of life is upside down than the world. Serving people, helping people. Jesus helped people and served people and gave his life. When we worship Jesus, why do we worship Jesus? We love him because he first, what? Loved us. Why do we love him? Because he saved us. He helped us. He stooped down and rescued us. He did what we couldn't do. So this heart of gratitude and appreciation and thankfulness and respect we have towards the Lord is because we look and we look at what he did for us and we have appreciation and love and we bow down and we say, God, thank you. I can't believe what you've done for me. Well, Jesus says in the same way, you're supposed to do that to others. In the same way. And so if you serve people, and help them, and stoop really low. And it's not about you and your ego. You just serve people and help people and bless people. Guess what will happen? You will affect the positive feelings and the emotions of people. They will be blessed. They will be, they will be helped. Their lives change. And when, when people's lives change because you have helped them, 
and been Christ-like and loving and served them, man, it, it affects people. And they, they're appreciative and they start to follow you and be a part of what you're doing and follow you on you know, Facebook and send money to your organization because you first help them. So as an influencer, this, I mean, just there's 10 of these things here. But, I mean, just one of them, servanthood, is just, okay, stop right there, you know? It's massive. It's huge. It's just, it's crazy. So at the end of this talk, when we get to 1 Kings chapter 12 and Luke chapter 6, I'm going to bring this all together, and you're going to see how these 10 things change people's lives and can influence someone very negatively or very positively. So these two verses here at the end are just going to be like the cherry on the Sunday. So stick around to the end where these two are just going to be, wow, very impactful. So Matthew 20, Mark 10, think on this text. Um, uh, I've been married almost 25 years. Uh, marriage just has its ups and downs. We have our struggles, difficulties. And one day I was just really struggling with something. And, you know, oh, you know, you know, I have to do this, I have to do that, and how come this, and how come that? And I was in the garage, and the Holy Spirit brought back this verse to me. And it says, whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Wow. You know, I demand rights. I demand respect. I'm not getting my way. And God was like, Aaron, you have to be a slave. You're my slave. Wow. And one day I was sitting by the kitchen sink, and God has often talked to me on the kitchen sink, and I didn't want to do the dishes, but I knew I should, and I was doing the dishes. And I put my hands on the sink, and I'm like, God, how come you sometimes speak to me by the kitchen sink? And the Holy Spirit said to me, because serving is where I am. Wow. Lots to do. Lots of work to do. Serving creates positive feelings in followers that they want to be around you. Knowledge. Uh, we are commanded in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, to grow in knowledge. Well, you think about a teacher, a coach, a parent, uh, how they have tremendous influence over somebody because if someone is a person of knowledge, like a professor, a teacher, a pastor, or a youth pastor, and they have knowledge that is always encouraging and and teaching and teaching God's word and benefiting people. Well, when, when people love to be around a great Bible teacher or, or speaker, how do they feel? They feel helped. They feel benefited. They want to keep coming back because it's just a natural cause and effect that if you've helped them through serving, knowledge, preaching, teaching, that you're helping people and people want to come back. It's just a normal thing. So we're commanded in 2 Peter 1, 5 and 6 to grow and add to our learning knowledge. Lots to say about that. Um, number three is ethical or integrity. That's kind of a basic as a Christian, but we, be, we need to be reminded of that. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 15 says, be holy as I am holy. So the standard of integrity is holiness perfection without sin and so our conduct and our character and our morality behind closed doors is that we are to be ethical people of integrity striving for holiness or being ethical how many leaders do we know i can start naming them off pastors youth pastor that failed morally maybe they were serving and had knowledge but the moment they failed ethically they lost their ministry. Uh, good men and women can lose their families and their marriages, right? We know that because of... So this building block of being ethical and keeping our standards and keeping our hearts in check is so huge. Now, when followers see people and pastors and people in ministry with integrity, what does that do? Well, it creates respect. 
you know, we all have maybe had teachers and coaches and parents that they were, they were people who said what they said they were going to do. They did what they said they were going to do. They were the same person in the public as they were behind closed doors. And they were people of excellence. They were knowledgeable. They served people. Man, just three of these things creates positive feelings in followers. It creates positive feelings and influence over people that they want to be around us. They want to be a part of what they're doing because you have benefited them and helped them. Next one is listening. You know, listening. James 1.19 says, be uh, quick to listen, slow to speak. How many times have we gotten in trouble <laughs> because we didn't obey that verse, right? We were quick to talk and, uh, and we didn't listen. And so no one ever talked their way uh, listen, excuse me, no one ever listened their way out of a job. We often get in trouble because we talk too much. We say the wrong thing. So what does listening do? Listening says, I care about you. I hear you. I want to understand you. And we all know what it feels like not to be listened to, not to be appreciated, not to be understood. Like leadership 101 is really learning to put our opinions aside and understand the other person. There's so much that can be said about listening to people. So when you're listening to people and you care about people and you hear their ideas, I mean, people have good ideas too. It's not just negative. It's people in your life, uh, you know, have good ideas. And so much can be said because the leader, the attitude of the leader is, you know, they're in charge, they're the boss, they're the pastor. Man, there is so much to be said about humbling ourselves and listening to the concerns of others and the ideas of others, the creativity of others, the experience of others. Wow. If leaders did that more, how much better would our ministries be by listening to people? Um, Harvard Business Review um, did a study that basically, like one of the very first things they said that a leader should do is get feedback from their followers very humbling, but they said that's the number one thing is let people tell you how they feel about your job performance. Hmm. Uh, fifth one here is family. Wow. Well, there's probably no institution, hopefully, on the earth that does this better than the church, right? Because everybody wants to be a part of a team or a place to belong or a a place like family. And so the church that God instituted was God's idea to create the church. And so in Acts 14, 27, uh, it says they called the church together. The church is people. And so anytime you're part of a group, an organization, a small group, a church, we want to create family. You know, it's not an organization, it's family. Uh, you invite people into your family. You share your feelings. You talk about your needs. You open up. You invite them in. You share their lives. You eat together. Why did Jesus eat meals together so often? Because eating together, I mean, God could have made it that we only eat once a week, <laughs> once a month, once a year. But why did God design it the way that he did that we always have to eat? I think one of the reasons why is for community, for uh, people getting together. And so the church of Jesus Christ coming around a cause of creating family, inviting people in to hear their story and share our story with them and invite them in. Man, the church should be the number one place to do that. So anytime you're a ministry, nonprofit, youth group, church, whatever you're a part of, find ways to create family. People want family. People want a place to belong. And they will stick around and be benefited because you took them in and created a family for them and met needs for them that they didn't have before. Uh, sixth one is empathy. Empathy is huge. Think about the story Jesus told about the Good Samaritan. Uh, someone's dying. They're on the road. They're bleeding. And the priests, the Pharisees, they walk. Oh, these, these are religious people. They walk over the dying man. And it was the Samaritan, someone not like them, someone not of their race, 
that stooped down and helped the person and showed empathy. So Jesus showed that as a model of empathy. Jesus said, love one another. He washed people's feet. Well, what does this kind of servanthood and caring and empathy do uh, for people? It creates positive feelings in them like, wow, I can't believe they did that. Respect, awe, appreciation, thankfulness. When you do these things that God has ordained, it just it humbled me that I just wasn't, the leadership principle here is that I wasn't connecting the dots to how all this all fit together. It's like, well, listening, okay. Serving, okay. But what it is, is it's like one big uh, cause and effect relationship. I plug in my laptop, I get electrical charge, boom. If I say a harsh word to my wife, boom, I get an electrical charge of negativity because I was negative to her. Uh, if I come home and I bring her flowers and I give her a big hug and I say, hey, I haven't said this to you in a while, but you are such a blessing to us. Wow. What, I mean, what is that going to do? <laughs> that's, that's, that's a positive energy. That's a positive thing. That's godliness. That's showing, you know, serving and listening and being empathetic. And I mean, these principles create a positive charge. They create a positive feeling in people. And it's a cause and effect relationship. When someone is served and helped and listened to and cared for and empathetic and you invite them in to be a part of something, it, like plugging in the wall socket, these, these are good things. These are godly things. These are God-ordained things that it will, it will affect people. It affects them in a good way. So now, if they like you, see, they like you, they're appreciative of you because you're doing these things and you have a vision that you're part of, well, there's going to be people coming around and voting with their feet and liking what you're doing. Well, the next one, a couple, are delegating and empowerment. Okay? Jesus is the master at showing delegation, isn't he? He, you know, said, follow me. The disciples watched him, and then he sent them out two by two, you know, the 72 and the 12, and he got people involved in ministry. Wow, you get people involved in your ministry, you don't hoard it all to yourself. You see, you know, godly qualities in people, and you start to delegate and say, hey, you know, I think you'd be really good at this. I can see you doing this. Well, what does delegating and empowerment do for people? It makes them feel like they're a part of a cause bigger than themselves, that, they're, that they have a purpose to their life. People just, you know, they stay home and stay on their phone. They just know they're, they're not doing anything. But when you give them a purpose and a cause and you invite them in to serve and they feel good about themselves and they're making a difference and they see how they're benefiting people, delegation does that and it makes people feel like they're a part of something. So delegation like Jesus did is huge. Uh, next one is empowerment. Empowerment is simply if people feel like they're growing, they're not the same person they were six months ago, a year ago, three years ago, that doing all these things and the purpose and vision and knowledge, and all these things that you're doing that they're growing, they're being empowered because of you, you know, they'll stick around. Do you think the disciples felt empowered by Jesus? <laughs> Absolutely, right? What did, uh, the disciples say, they said, teach us how to pray. And Jesus taught them how to pray. Did they feel empowered? Absolutely. So if you're, you know, you're giving your life to people and you're empowering them, you're making their lives better, man, they're, how they feel about you is going to be huge and positive. So now, as a leader, if you say, hey, let's do this, let's go here, let's do this together, let's change this, let's, you know, they'll probably want to be around you and be a part of your cause because of how you have positively affected them. Uh, here's one story. Uh, I was uh, part of a church where the church wasn't going so well, the pastor left, um, they hired a consultant, he came in, uh, he didn't listen, he didn't show empathy, uh, he wasn't... Um, he was new, 
Uh, I guess he was knowledgeable, but he came in and he said, we're not going to do this, not going to do this, we're going to stop this, stop this, stop this, and it made a lot of people what? Mad. Now, how did his actions, how did that, his actions make the followers feel? Angry, bitter, who are you? How could you do this? Who are you? Didn't have to do that. He could have came in, listened to them, took time, been empathetic, you know, served them, walked beside them, earned their trust. Leadership experts say that the foundation of leadership is trust. I'm going to follow you with my life. I'm going to give my life to you. I'm going to, my time, my energy, my money, I'm going to, they have to feel safe. They have to feel like they trust you. You know, Colin Powell, you know, if you, if you don't know who Colin Powell is, he was one of the leaders in Washington, D.C. with the Bush administration and others. Uh, he basically said um, the foundation of leadership is trust. Do I trust you with my life? Do I want to be around you? So trust, these things make people trust you. So when you say, hey, we should do this together, we should go here, they're going to see you as an ethical person, a trustworthy person. You've helped them. You've served them, and, and you've built trust in their life. So now if you have to make hard decisions or make changes, they're more likely to get up and follow you. Uh, humility. Isn't humility the chief cornerstone of the Christian life? Philippians chapter 2, right? Uh, it says, have this mind be in you as it was in Christ Jesus. He did not consider the glory that he had, something to be held on to, but he made himself nothing and became a servant and died for our sins. When was the last time you heard a sermon on humility? It's the cornerstone of the Christian life. You know, it's usually it's ego and power and authority and status. And Jesus is upside down. He didn't care about status. He didn't care about titles. He didn't care about you know, being in charge or being the boss, he served and helped and loved and modeled it and died and rose. And now we look at him and we love him for what, how he's loved us. So humility also in a leader is when we realize that we don't have it all together. We don't have all the answers. When a leader feels like they are in charge and they have, they're the authority and they're the expert, Man, you're human. I'm human. A degree behind your name does not take away your humanness. You're 100% human. I'm 100% human. And showing your followers that you're human too and that you have flaws and you struggle and you're open about it, you know what that's going to do? That's going to show how they feel about you. Gosh, that they can relate to you. And you know what? Humility also says, I need some help. I need some help. I don't have, I'm not an expert in finances. I'm not an expert in technology. I'm not an expert in, you know, marriage counseling or whatever issue you're struggling with. Ask for help. Because leaders, who said a leader has to be, have it all together? Leadership is simply saying, I want to be an influencer and I sometimes I need help. Well, the last one is courage. Courage. And so in 2 Corinthians 16, 13, it says we are to be courageous. We have to make hard decisions. Was Jesus courageous in the face of danger? Was the Apostle Paul courageous in the face of danger? Were the disciples courageous? No, at times they weren't, but then later they were. So courageous means we have to make hard decisions. We don't always feel it or like it, but sometimes we have to make the right decision. And so courage is huge. And so if we do these 10 things, here's something that's really awesome. If a leader says, here's my vision, let's go. Well, who are you? I don't know you. And the leader starts out of a choice to show his character and starts to do these 10 things really well. Guess what they're doing? Guess what you're doing if, you, if you're doing these 10 things well? Guess what you're doing? 
You're loving people. You're loving people. Isn't the supreme ethic of Christianity to love one another as I have loved you? You ask the average Christian, like, what is love? Define love. Man, they scratch their chin. They might say uh, self-sacrifice. Okay, good. True. I agree with you. What does self-sacrifice look like? You drop your ego and you serve. You don't want the credit. You don't care about the credit. You don't want to be, have a title. Who cares about a title? You're here just to serve the audience of one. Like Jesus served the audience of one. We serve. We grow in knowledge. We listen to people. We're ethical. We, we show care. We invite people in and create family. We empower others. We delegate. We invite people to serve and disciple them. We show humility. We're courageous. We you know what that's doing when you do all that with people without ego and attitude? and You're loving people. You're loving people. This is what Christian love can look like in your ministry, in your church. You do all this, you're loving people. You're leading in love. You're showing love. Even though people can't define it, they don't know what it is, they can't write it down, but all they know is that you have positively affected their life. And in return, it's just the way God has made us. It's a cause and effect relationship. If we feel helped, we naturally want to help. If we feel blessed, we want to return the blessing. If someone is really generous around us, encourages us to be generous, etc. So now, I want to do the big reveal at the end here about how this all continues to um, center in on the Bible. First Kings chapter 12, verses 1 through 19. You know, I was thinking through all this, studying all this, and, you know, doing my devotions. And one day, I saw this text, and it was like, oh my goodness. It just connected the dots with everything we've been learning. Because leadership, remember, is influence. So influence can be positive and negative. So here in the story of 1 Corinthians, uh, excuse me, 1 Kings chapter 12, 1 Kings chapter 12, uh, Solomon, King Solomon dies. And so Rehoboam, his son, succeeded him as king. So now Rehoboam is a young man. He gets together uh, with the elders, the older men. Elder just means older man. He gets together with the elders and said, what do I do? You know, my dad's dead. I'm a young man. He, he you know, went to the elders and said, what do I do? This is huge. Listen to what it says in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 7. The elders responded to Rehoboam, if today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. Wow. They're like, Rehoboam, if you love people, what does love look like? If you love people, you serve people. You stoop down and you love people and you serve people. You get off your throne and you become a friend and a servant and a helper. You make people's lives better. That's the big thing. You're make, you make people's lives better. You're serving them. You're, 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 you got their back. A leader, do they have your, do they have your back? Are they, are they making your life better? So the elders are saying, make people's lives better. Serve them. And in response, guess what? They'll serve you. A win-win. Their lives are better. They'll serve the king, make his life better. And guess what will happen to the kingdom? The kingdom, because the kingdom or an organization or a church, anything is made up of what? People. And so in this sense, the nation of Israel, the kingdom, guess what's going to happen to the kingdom? The kingdom is going to be healthy and growing and strong. Rehoboam, in his ignorance and attitude and arrogance, rejected their word, and he said this to them. Um, he basically said this, 
um, they said your they said the they said that your dad Solomon put a heavy yoke on us right they he made them build a lot of stuff and so uh, they admitted that you know your dad put a lot of heavy a heavy yoke on our neck Rehoboam rejected their advice and said this what is this advice how should we answer these people and say lighten our yoke he basically said this I will make it heavier I will make it heavier verse 11 my, my father scourged you with whips, and I will scourge you with scorpions. What? Verse 11. You know what happened? The people rebelled. And one of these guys in the story got killed, and Rehoboam left. He got kicked out. Well, what kind of attitude of the leader and influence does that have on followers? How did that make them feel? My father used whips, I'm gonna use scorpions. How did that make them feel? They revolted, they rejected, they you know, kicked them out, right, negatively. So our leadership and our influence can affect people negatively and it can affect people positively. What we do is going to make people feel positive or negative. Think about your marriage, your male, female. Think about how you treat your wife or husband. How are we doing in this, these areas? What does your love life <laughs> look like in your home? Because your love life will affect the feelings of the followers, your, your wife or husband and your kids. So wonderful Old Testament story about the power of influence negatively over people's lives. Now the last one is Jesus. Jesus being the master teacher, if you'd like a text to ground all of this in scripture, you can take months and years to really meditate on this. So all of this teaching is wrapped up in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through, uh, 27 through 42. Luke chapter 6, 27 through 42. Give your heart and soul to it. Memorize it. Meditate on it. It will change your life. The ideas here are found in this text. The big idea here is in these verses here in Luke chapter 6, verse 37. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, running over, we poured out into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So that's the principle. For the measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. So Rehoboam, what did he do? What measure, what, what did he do? He wanted scorpions. He wanted to be in charge. He wanted to beat people down and be in control and ego and attitude and anger. Well, the measure that you use will be measured to you. Anger, hostility, pain, suffering cause people to revolt and say, I don't want that. Violence, get him out of here. Somebody died. Jesus says, the measure that you use will be measured back to you. So if you're a forgiving person and you forgive, most likely people will be moved by that and be forgiving back. If you're a generous person, people will be moved to be generous back. You know, if you're super critical and super condemning, people are going to be critical towards you back. But if you're very loving and open and listen to people, they're going to be most likely moved by that and loving and open too. So if you, you withhold judgment and just listen to people and be open to people, you'll change people's lives and affect the environment that you're in and the culture that you're in. So Jesus said that the measure that you use will be measured back to you. So if a leader, you can be like your attitude... You can be King Solomon, and the, or, or Rehoboam, really, Rehoboam, 
the attitude that you have, you're going to be negative. You get negativity back. You can be Jesus in your attitude and do these things. The measure that you use will be measured to you. So how did Jesus make his followers feel? He did this and more. <laughs> they liked him. They appreciated him. They loved him. And people then followed Jesus because they wanted to. Not about money or fame or status. They loved him. We love him. <coughs> we love him because he first loved us. So a leader has the position of being Christ-like. And how are you Christ-like in your ministry? How are you Christ-like in your family? How are you Christ-like in your marriage? You're a leader. You're an influencer. And you say, well, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. You look at these 10 things, and you say, okay, you know, what am I naturally good at? Well, I can look at a few things. And then the other things, you just start to say, okay, I'm going to study. I'm going to Google. I'm going to YouTube. I'm going to TED Talk, read books, whatever it is. Empathy, listening skills, empowerment, discipling. So really empowerment is really discipleship, you know, discipling people, delegating, humility. Man, just start growing in your knowledge of all these things. And over time, you'll just get better and better and better. Well, I'm Aaron, and this is the science of Christian leadership. Uh, you probably feel like I hose sprayed you with a big hose of of stuff, but I'm thankful that you went all the way through this talk. I hope it helped you. Please leave a comment below of any ideas, encouragement, suggestions, because I'm still growing too. And if you say to yourself, well, what about this? You forgot something. Well, I, I probably did. This is not scripture, okay? This is not inspired. Is there more? Yeah. But 10 of these things is enough. <laughs> That's enough, okay? That's enough to work on. That's enough to think about. Is there more? Probably. But I think for the areas that we learn, we could mo most likely put these under something, you know, and of how to grow as a leader. Because in the end, you know, our status and fame and ideas and our influence is going to be judged by the one who created life. And our goal is to live for an audience of one and to please him more, uh, moreover.